I am pleased to introduce Dr. Michelle Wood Trigesser, who is a postdoctoral associate in Alexander Reykjavik's lab, um, where she's working on premature ovarian failure um, research. And um, she is the third in our third series of how to talks, formerly known as postdoc talks, which are um, you know, informational talks given by postdocs. So I'm very pleased you're all here. I'm pleased Dr. Woodrigger is here. And today she's going to be talking about how to identify a gene of interest from exome sequencing results. Okay. Thanks. So now that we're back on track. <laughs> um, so I just want to say that what I'm going to go over today is applicable to a wide range of next-gen sequencing technologies, not just whole exome sequencing, but because that's what we focus on in our lab, that's what I'm going to be talking the most about. Um, just for those of you who don't know what whole exome sequencing is, basically you take the DNA from your genome, you break it up into very small pieces, you then select out the pieces that you're interested in um, with a capture kit. And these capture kits can be customized to either look at all exons in the human genome or in the mouse. You can also have a very um, disease-specific capture kit where you can look at just genes that you're interested in for your particular purposes. Whatever the capture kit is, you select out these fragments that you're interested in, and then you prepare these selected fragments for sequencing. So once they're prepared for sequencing, you put them on the sequencer and you get back all of this data, that's a bunch of nucleotides. And so what we need to do is to look at these nucleotides and try and find where there are differences compared to a reference. So if we take a reference genome, you can then align your data, and software is available to help you identify these differences. Some of these differences might not mean anything, they might be benign. Others of these differences might be pathogenic and might contribute to your disease. And so depending on the software package that you use, you likely are going to end up getting some kind of very large spreadsheet with a ton of different variants. And so what we need to do is decide which of these variants is actually important and relevant to our disease and which ones are probably not important. And so hopefully, by going through these steps that I'm going to go over today, you can take your list from hundreds to thousands of variants long to maybe tens to fifties of variants long. That's the hope, always. So where can you begin? So this talk is actually going to be divided up into two basic sections. The first section is going to go through how to narrow down out of this list of thousands of variants um, which ones you should hone in on. And the second part of the talk will be how to annotate those variants that you identify to actually see if they're relevant to your disease or not. And I'll get into some of the databases that you can use to do that. So in our lab, it's taken us about a year and a half. Uh, we're now have been doing this successfully, I would say, for over a year now, um, to actually come up with this very um, this pipeline that we have. And it's been pretty successful. We actually have two papers that will be coming out um, the 1st of December where we identified specific variants in two different families that are relevant to our disease. So I hope that um, this pipeline can also help you in your studies. My disclaimer is that this is just one possible pipeline. And so depending on the disease that you're studying, you may choose to use or not use some of these filters or, um, or databases that we use for our studies. Um, you can also do the filtering in any of the order that you please. This is just the way that we have designed this particular pipeline. Okay, I don't put this up here to have you know all of this. I just put this up here to say that no matter what software you use to actually call variants, there are many, many steps involved. We happen to use the BWA GATK pipeline, but all of these different steps are involved in actually identifying variants that are of high quality. So whatever software you use, and I encourage you to get to know all of the parameters of your software. Take the time to learn what are all the different options, what do they mean. Basically, whatever software you use, whether it's BWA, GATK, whether it's um, CLC Workbench, whether it's NextGene, um, get to know all of the different parameters. But four of the parameters that we like to look at include mapping quality, coverage, position of the variant in the read, and genotype quality. So what do all these parameters look for? Well, mapping quality, if we go over to the board, 
takes a look at if black is the reference, how well do, does each individual read align to this reference? Is it a perfect match? Maybe it just matches at the ends but not in the middle? Or maybe it's just small portions of a read that might align to your reference. So whatever the parameters are for your software, you want to try and identify the parameters that will get you the best mapping quality. The second one is coverage. So because you're using a capture kit, if you're doing exome sequencing, not all regions of the genome will be equally covered with your sequencing. And so if you have a region of the genome that maybe only two reads align to, and there's a variant called in one of these reads, you can't have high confidence that that variant is actually real. It might just be some noise. But if you have a region of the genome where you have many, many variants that align, then you can have more confidence that a variant that's called in that region would actually be real, especially if it's in more than one of the reads that aligns there. Okay. So in our experience, we use um, a minimum of 10 as a cutoff, but for maximum, we like to have coverage of 50 to 100. And actually, anything over 100 is the best. <laughs> that's what we've come up with in our lab, which can get very expensive. But that's the best quality reads we've been able to find. Um, the other parameter I want to point out is that we always like to look for, is the variant called in just one read? Or is it called in multiple reads? So we have a cutoff where we like to make sure that this variant is called in more than four reads that align to a particular region. So if it only is present in one read out of 25 reads that align to this region, we'll throw it away. But if it aligns, if it's in 10 reads out of 25 reads, we'll keep it. Okay. So those, this, this is probably one of the most important parameters that we have adapted. Um, the next parameter that we like to look at is position of the variant in the read. And so what that looks at is where in a particular read, if each line is a sequence, is the variant called in the middle of the read, like this particular example, or is it called at the end of the read? So based on sequencing, if you think about how the process of sequencing works, you're doing, in our case, we do two by 100 base pair paradigm sequencing. What that means is that you're exposing your template to a laser every cycle. And so as you get into 95, 96, 97 cycles, your sample might actually be degrading. So if you're calling a variant at the very end of a read, it might not actually be due to sequence variation, but due to an error based on degradation. And so we like to have variants that lie within the middle of the reads, at the beginning of the reads, we don't like them to be at the very end. Now, if you find a variant at the end of the read, and that same variant is present in other reads that are in the middle, then you can still keep that variant. <clears throat> but there are different parameters to look at this um, position of the variant within the read. The other parameter associated with this that we like to look at is called strand bias. So because we do 2 by 100 base pair paradigm sequencing, you're sequencing from right to left, but also left to right. And so you want to make sure that if you're calling the variant, it's not just always in one direction. You want to make sure you're picking it up in both directions. And so there are other parameters that look at the strand bias that can help you determine whether or not you're calling this variant only in one direction or the other. Um, the final parameter we look at is genotype quality. And genotype quality takes into account basically previous knowledge about that particular region of the genome. You might use Thousand Genomes Database or some other training set of data to look and see, okay, has this variant been called before? Can we have high confidence that this variant was called? Um, if we look at this particular region of the genome, in your reads, are we only seeing two different options, right? Because you have one copy from mom, one copy from dad. Or are you seeing three or four options, right? If you're seeing three or four options, it's probably not as critical as the two main options that you're seeing. So the genotyping quality takes a lot of different things into account, but it definitely is important when trying to decide if your variant is real or important to keep considering. Um, 
So all I can say is that these filters, what they're called and how you might set them and the limits for them will depend very specifically on the software that you're using. So please take the time to get to know your software. <laughs> Um, are there any questions on that? Okay. So the next important filtering criteria that we use depends on what kind of samples are we looking at. Are we looking at a family? Are we looking at maybe tumor sample versus normal sample? And so what you could use is the inheritance pattern that you would expect for your particular disease. In our case, we like to look for um, for variants that are inherited in a recessive manner, um, because in this particular family, it was only in daughters that were in the final generation. It wasn't present in any of the other generations. So we were looking for a recessive gene. So we can look for those genes based on sequencing of other family members that were inherited in that particular manner. And we can eliminate anything else that wasn't inherited in that manner. Or if you're looking, we do some other studies where we look at um, cancer samples and non-cancer samples, and maybe you're looking for things that are only in the cancer samples, you can eliminate anything that's not in the cancer samples. And so using a particular inheritance or filtering criteria based on what samples you have available can really eliminate the number of variants that you have to continue filtering through. Okay. So of course, we're interested in exomes. Um, and we focus on the exomes, well, one, for cost, two, because if there's a mutation in a protein coding gene, you're more likely to have a phenotype for our particular disease. Um, so we focus mainly on insertions, deletions, frame shifts, and splice sites. That's not to say that you wouldn't be interested in regulatory regions. You might be interested in introns or intergenic regions. However, the relevance of those particular variants at the current time can still be a little unknown. Um, now with the ENCODE data that's coming out and a lot more of that information being available, these may become much more relevant, but especially since we're using an exome capture kit, you're gonna have the most reliable data in the exome regions. So we try and filter out anything that might have popped up outside of those capture regions. Um, as I said, we're interested in things that change protein coding regions. So if there are silent mutations within the genome, meaning that a particular mutation does not cause an amino acid change in the protein, then we throw those out at the beginning because we don't really see how if you say we have a, a protein that has an isoleucine, and isoleucine can be encoded by an A, U, U. Well, if the U is mutated to a C, what does it mean if it now says A, U, C, but you still get an isoleucine? Right, so that's still really unknown. There are some more recent studies that have come out showing that these silent mutations might be relevant, but for what we're focusing on right now, and if you're trying to do a quick and dirty filtering for your particular disease, you know, this is one way you can eliminate some of those variants. Okay. So another thing that we use that you may choose not to use, and I, I put this in here with caution, there were two papers that came out from the NIH in their um, Undiagnosed Diseases Program. And these two papers identified a list of genes that were known to be located in a region that was highly polymorphic. And some of these genes have characteristics that when assembly occurs, um, when you're comparing reads to your reference, there might be some suggested things that suggest misalignment. So maybe you have a higher frequency of your reads not aligning correctly. These genes also um, had some misinformation within the reference, and so it would call variants that weren't necessarily real within the data set that they were looking at particularly. So we actually use these lists and filter out any variants that appear within these genes. Now, for your, your studies, you should make sure that none of the genes of interest lie in these genes. Um, otherwise, you might be filtering out things that are important to you, but for us, we've gone through all these genes and we know that they're likely not to be involved in our particular disease. Okay, and one of the last, I would say not last, but certainly not least criteria that we use to get rid of variants from this list of thousands is the allele frequency. So it's really important to understand 
what is the prevalence of the disease within the population you're studying. Is it a rare disease, as it is in our case, where it only occurs in 1 to 4% of women under the age of 40? Or are you looking at heart disease that maybe occurs in 40% of the population? So how frequently would you expect this variant or um, mutation to actually be present within the population? So it's very important to identify, you can use Hardy-Weinberg to calculate it yourself based on you know, pre um, information that's available in the literature. But it's important to know how frequently you would expect a particular variant to occur within the population. Um, in our case, it's nice because we're looking for things that are very infrequent, so we can filter out anything that is present more frequently. However, in some of the other diseases, this filter might not help you very much. So, okay. So the XM variant server is just one tool you can use to get some information on variant frequency. And I'm gonna switch out of the PowerPoint and just go straight to the website. So this particular website is put up by NHLBI, um, and they've done a huge exome sequencing project. And it's quite a comprehensive list of all the different variants. And so all you have to do, you can search either by the specific variant that you have, or you can search all the variants in a particular gene. So just for example, we'll put one gene in. You can see they have this broken down into two different populations. They have European American and African American populations, so depending on what your region of interest might be. And if you do this, you get all kinds of information about each variant. And so, I don't know, I have a larger screenshot in my um, PowerPoint. Some of the information that's available is allele frequency in the European American population, allele frequency in the African American population, allele frequency in all of the populations they looked at. Um, how frequent are the particular genotypes? And of course it will calculate a percentage for you. And so um, this information, if it's a variant that's been previously reported, can be helpful in trying to get this information to narrow down your list. Now if you have a truly novel variant, um, it's not going to be present here, right? And so in that case, you're not going to filter it out. You're just going to keep it in your list for the present time. Okay. So hopefully by now, after going through these quality filter checks and things that are relevant to your disease or things that are inherited in a manner that you hope they would be inherited in, you've narrowed down your list to the tens of variants, and hopefully it's still not in the hundreds of thousands. If it is, um, I feel bad for you, but it does happen. Um, and so what we need to do now is try and decide how are we going to annotate these variants and decide which ones are actually important to our disease. So I try to come up with, okay, how do I logically go through this on a, on a daily basis? And so I came up with a decision tree. And so this particular decision tree goes through, once we have a mutation, um, we go through all the information that's available on that particular mutation. Is it predicted to be damaging? Is it conserved? Has it previously been reported? Maybe it's relevant to our population. Maybe it's not. Where is it expressed? What is its function? So is its function relevant to our disease? Is it known to be involved in disease or not? And um, what kind of literature is out there? And so once you go through this whole process, Hopefully you haven't discarded all of your variants as variants of unknown significance. That's what the BUS stands for. Okay, hopefully it's still something that you can carry through and follow up with experimentation. And so my next half of this talk will be to go through some databases that you can use to try and gather information to make decisions at each one of these points. Okay, so I come back to XM Variant Server because it does provide some of this information. And if we zoom in to the far end of the list, one of the things it does provide you is a polyphen 2 score. Now this polyphen 2 score can help you determine if the protein is damaging, probably damaging, benign, or maybe it's unknown. Unknown is not really informative, but if it's known to be benign, then it might not be one you need to keep in your list. Um, if your protein, or if your mutation is novel, but you know what gene it is in, and you know the amino acid sequence of that gene, you can actually go to the Polyphen 2 website 
and actually do this by yourself. All you have to do is paste in your amino acid sequence here and pick what was the original amino acid, what's the predicted new amino acid, what position does it occur at, and it will calculate for you um, the predicted probability of this mutation being damaging or not. Um, there is also another tool out there called SIFT. This is just another prediction algorithm that you can use to help you determine whether or not this particular variant will result in a protein that is um, predicted to be damaging or not to the function of the protein. Um, XM Variant Server can also give you some information on conservation. Uh, this is called a GERP score, but basically what this tell, tells you is that if you have a high number, this particular variant occurs at a region that is highly conserved. However, if, it, if you get a low score, this particular variant is at a region that maybe is not well conserved. And so we use this as a filter in our lab because we think that if it's not in a conserved location, meaning maybe this uh, nucleotide is not present at the same place in mouse, in monkey, in some of the lower species, maybe it's not as critical to the function of the protein as it would be if it's a, um, a nucleotide that is highly conserved. So we use not only information from the exome variant server, but we also use information from the UCSC genome browser that is available. And so if you go to UCSC genome browser, and you scroll all the way down to the bottom of all the different tracks you can select from, you can select conservation and conservation 46 way to be um, present. And this will give you this information down here at the bottom. And this particular information, um, you can zoom in down to the amino acid level, and you can specifically select the different uh, species that you're interested in. But one thing that we also like to do is to look at the nucleotide conservation at this level. And so a trick that we've learned is that if you right click on the track and you go to configure multi-align, you can then select any particular species you're interested in and you can also switch between no codon translation to give you the nucleotide or you can keep the translation and look at the amino acid. So you can use one tool to look at both amino acid conservation and nucleotide conservation across species. If you click OK, it will apply all of this information to the particular tracks you're looking at. And so you can see that this particular amino acid is conserved all the way through all of these different species, but this um, nucleotide is not as well conserved through all the particular species. So this is just another piece of information that we use in trying to determine whether or not we're going to keep a variant in our list. Okay. So these tools that I've um, showed you so far, you can get some information on whether or not this variant is predicted to be damaging. You can also get some information on whether or not this variant occurs at a conserved location within a particular gene. And hopefully, you still have variants in your list that you can keep going through the decision tree and you haven't thrown them all out. So the next thing we like to look at is, um, was the variant previously reported? If you've already looked in the exome variants server, you'll know whether or not your variant is present or not. Um, and does it occur in a relevant population? So, again, I just point out that the exome variant server has two different populations that it looks at. Um, another resource you can use is dbSNP. dbSNP can provide another read for allele frequency. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, for some of the variants, you can find some information about is it present in a European population, Asian population, Sub-Saharan Africa, depending on the variant. Now, not every variant has all of this information. Um, some of the more highly annotated variants do. One caveat I have to say is that both of these databases are limited in that you don't know anything about the populations really that are present in these databases. So in our case, we're interested in infertile women. But if these are databases of the population at large, you don't know anything about the fertility status 
of the women in these databases. You also might not even know, are you looking at statistics for male versus female? And that might have an impact on your studies. So these are just important caveats to keep in mind before you filter something out just because it's already been reported. Um, so that's why in this decision tree, the relevant population I leave kind of as a diamond, as an unknown. Like you really have to know if what's been reported is in a relevant population before you can proceed. Um, so either way, the next step would be to look at the expression pattern for your particular variant or the gene that your variant is affecting. And to do this, um, I think we're going to talk about expression and function kind of together. You can use similar databases for this. One of them that we use is called EST profiles, which is present in the unigene function of the NCBI suite of packages. And so EST profiles can be found if you search for your gene. You can get a list of all the different genes in different species. You can actually get some conservation information here as well. So you can see how well conserved this gene is um, across different species. But if you come down here under gene expression, we like to click on EST profiles and look there. Um, I will say that we like to look at both human and mouse expression patterns uh, because sometimes there's more known about the expression in the mouse versus the human. So it may or may not be relevant to your studies to do that. But once you click on EST profiles, they have a large list of different tissues. And these particular dots um, indicate that this gene is expressed, at least at the RNA level, within these different tissues. And the darker the dot, the more highly expressed. The lesser the dot, the less it's expressed. If you scroll down a little bit beyond this, um, I think there are some information about different disease types. There are a few cancers that are listed. There are also um, fetal stages of development in some cases that are also listed. So make sure you scroll all the way through the different um, categories at the bottom. So this is just one measure of gene expression. Another tool you can use is called BioGPS. Um, BioGPS, you can search, you can do a batch search, which is nice because you can look at a bunch of different genes all at once. Um, you can also look at different species. You can select the species that you want. And for this particular uh, website, we tend to use the mouse because it's more highly annotated than the human. But you can always change, up here at the top there's data sets, and you can change the data set that you're looking at. So you can look at different types of studies that have been done and look at the expression in those different studies to try and make one um, collective agreement as to whether or not your, the gene in which your variant is in is in a tissue that you're interested in. Um, and so you can get these nice graphical displays and it lists a bunch of different tissues and different cell lines which the expression has been measured in. And it can give you some hint as to whether or not this particular variant might be expressed in your tissue. Now, I, we, have, we run into this caveat a lot, and you may or may not, is that certain genes, um, for us, because we're looking at the ovary, are expressed in meiosis. Well, meiosis in the female is completed before the time of birth. And so you don't know necessarily that the ovary in this particular list, is it adult? Is it fetal? Or is it someone in puberty? You don't know. So the expression at this point for this particular gene shows to be real low. Well, I can tell you that in our studies, we actually found this gene to be relevant. So it's just another piece of information to use. Um, and I'm going to kind of repeat that a lot. You're going to get a lot of different information. You know, be selective about what you use to actually filter out your information. Um, so just because it's not found to be expressed in the tissue that you're interested in doesn't necessarily mean that it's not. So just use that kind of as a little bit of as a taste, but not necessarily as a totally eliminating factor. Um, this particular tool can also provide you links to different other information about the gene, and we'll also talk about some other databases that have more information about the genes of interest. One of my favorite websites is actually Unipro. And Unipro you can use to look for all kinds of information about the protein. What's its function? Where is it expressed? Does it have disease relevance? 
Um, it also provides some links to references. So if you search for a gene, you might get a list like this in all different kind of species. So you can go ahead and click on your species of interest. And this gives you a nice, uh, I feel like guinea part is very easy to read, to go through. Some of the other um, resources that are out there are very messy, which I'll show you in, the, in another slide or two. But basically, this particular tool, you can look at function, taxonomy, subcellular localization, what's known about the pathology, all kinds of information about expression, the structure, are there particular protein domains that you might be interested in, and of course, other publications or information that might be relevant about this particular protein. So I find this, this is usually my first go-to um, website, but not everybody likes this tool as much as I do. Um, another very useful tool is the Mouse Genome Informatics uh, website. And this particular database can be extremely helpful because they have, um, not only can you get some information about the mouse models relevant to a particular gene that you're interested in, but they also have this human-mouse disease connection and they have a feature called mammalian phenotypes. And so if your gene is mutated in a particular location, and there's something known about a mouse model that has a mutation in that disease, it can tell you, oh, well, this particular um, gene resulted in infertility or embryonic lethality or um, the mice had hearing loss. So there are some other mammalian phenotype keywords that maybe are not under the heading of breast cancer or um, premature ovarian failure or whatever the disease name might be. There are more general mammalian phenotypes that may or may not be relevant to your disease. So I find that to be helpful. I also find this helpful because you can do a batch search. And so if you still have a list of 50 genes left, you can dump them all in and sort through them pretty quickly, um, looking specifically at the phenotype that you're interested in. All of these tools, I have to say, have many other features than the ones I'm highlighting, but I tend to use different tools for different things just because I like the information that you get from them. That's not to say you couldn't stick to one or the other for the information you're looking for. Um, this is just another tool, Gene Cards, and I'm not going to go too much into it. It functions a lot like Uniprot, it has links to other databases, can provide a lot of the same information. I don't prefer this database as much because there's a lot of advertisements and things that kind of clutter up the screen, um, but it can still be a useful tool if you, if you like this particular website. Okay. So now we know, you know, where is our gene expressed? What is the function of the particular gene? Or maybe you don't know. Maybe you still have no idea anything about this particular gene because there just isn't any information. Um, and usually if there's no information known about something, I really don't throw it out until the very, very end because you might find something later. Um, so the next thing we like to look at is what's known about this particular protein in disease involvement and what else is out there in the literature. Maybe there's information out there in the literature that's not related to your particular disease or gene, but maybe it comes up in, in our case, you know, if we're looking at female infertility, maybe we find something about male infertility, but it hasn't been studied in the female. So it might still be relevant, but um, you never know until you do the search. So some of the websites we like to use for this is OMIM. OMIM is a pretty comprehensive um, database that looks specifically at diseases and genes. And it, for any gene you look up, it can give you a description of the gene itself, mapping, gene function, but it then can also provide links to diseases it's been linked to. So then you can read up on the diseases that it's been linked to and see if any of those maybe are relevant to your disease. We've used this um, database in both capacities. We've found genes that are relevant to our disease of interest. We've also found genes that um, we had a variant in a gene that was in some kind of skin disorder. Well, none of our patients presented with any of the phenotypes of this particular skin disorder. So we were able to throw it out based on the fact that um, our patients just didn't have any of those characteristics. So you can use this kind of in both ways to keep or throw out a particular variant. Um, and I'll just say here that, you know, don't underestimate the power of PubMed. 
and Google to look for other information about your particular genes. You may find other information that wasn't in any of the other databases that you looked at. Um, and I know that sometimes I'll do kind of the peripheral word searches. So for instance, we're looking at premature ovarian failure, so I might just do my gene and reproduction, or my gene and fertility in general, or my gene and female, you know, because maybe it comes up in heart disease or something, but related specifically to the female. Um, so don't be afraid. This is kind of the point where I don't know anything about this gene at this point, so what else can I find out there? Or I might have an inkling that I'm interested in this gene, so what else can I find that might help our cause to keep this in our list? So regardless of the list that you end up with at the end, you, you invariably have to confirm it experimentally somehow. So I'm not going to go into how you would do that, um, because it depends on the gene that you actually find to be affected. The last gene that we identified was involved in DNA repair. So we had to learn all about DNA repair assays and go ahead and execute those. But if you find something on a sodium channel, you might have to go learn some electrophysiology, mutate the channel and see what happens to see if it's relevant. Um, so this is kind of the thought process that I go through. One of the other things that you may or may not have at your disposal is some previous genetic information that you have based on like a SNP array or maybe you've done a microarray analysis on your particular data set and you know, for instance, um, we use the SNP array to identify some regions of homozygosity. And so we knew that whatever variant we found would be located at a very specific region of one particular chromosome. So we were able to use that information to really narrow down our list kind of right away. Um, but you don't always have all that information. So you may um, find that besides doing sequencing, you might want to run some additional genetic screening just to help you narrow down that list. Okay. Now I will say that there are many other databases out there, many other tools that you might find handy. Um, we also use Human Gene Mutation Database. Um, we use ANOVAR and Genome Tracks. Uh, we've been known to use Ingenuity and String Networks. These are all different databases that are out there, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into all of these different databases. Um, they could, each particular database could be its own lecture um, on its own. And I also would direct you to the library's license tools, um, which you can see that there are many different tools, information on gene regulation, genetic variation, sequence analysis, pathway analysis, maybe you still have a list of 25 genes left by the time you get to the end. Maybe they're all involved in the same signaling pathway. You want to look at that information, what pathway is enriched in your particular variant. So some of these tools might be helpful depending on how many variants you have left. Um, and so with that, so basically I hope that today I've given you some way to start going through all the variants. Um, we've gone through ways in which we can narrow down our list of thousands to just a few genes based on things like mapping parameters and coverage, um, whether or not they're inherited in a specific manner, and so on and so forth. And then we've gone through a whole range of ways in which you can gather information about your variants to help you make an informed decision about whether or not that particular variant is relevant or not to your disease. Um, and so with that, I'm happy to share the slides with anybody who would like to have them. Please just shoot me an email, um, but I'll take any questions if there are any at this point. Go ahead. Oh, this, um, you don't have to necessarily answer So if you had to give a birth path of the time it takes for you, just after you get your raw variants to the state that you come down to say 20 uh, <laughs> I know it's a yeah, it, it's like a ballpark. So I can tell you that once we get the data off the sequencer, the raw data, um, depending on how big is your family, how many samples are you looking at, um, I would say if you have a family of four, that Wyong, you can align them and, and process the variants within 48 hours usually. Yeah, no, I was talking about after. And then after, after that. <laughs> His, well, that also includes, so our pipeline, oh, the gap our pipeline all the way through here is automated at this point. Okay. So we have a computer program that goes through all of this. Um, but that's using the computer scripting tools that Wyong has developed. Um, that's not to say that you wouldn't have to do that manually and that would add time. Yeah. 
right. The next step, um, this is, yeah. depending on how many variants you have and how familiar you are with the tools, I would say I can go through a variant in about 20 minutes and make a rough decision about whether or not it is. Now at the beginning, it took me a lot longer because I wasn't really sure what information would be the most relevant or the most helpful. Um, I was still learning how to use the tools. So it might take you, you know, an hour or two per variant if you're just getting started. If that's like a rough idea. How likely is it you'd go through this whole decision tree and end up with nothing? Um, it's happened. <laughs> it's happened. So then usually you have to take a step back and say, okay, well I filtered out some variants somewhere along the way because we thought they weren't relevant. So why might that be? Um, so then I go back and I, I usually kind of go in the reverse order. So, oh, I threw this away because of function. Well, is there anything in my tissue that might have this function and could this be relevant? You know, we like to think very... You know, we always like to think, oh, ovary, so we're looking at oocytes, but there's also granulosa cells and fecal cells and there's blood flow and there's many other things that are involved. And so um, I would say the first search I go through is usually very narrow, but then as if we find nothing, we kind of take a step back and go, okay, well, what else could be going on in this particular disease? Um, so then if you've gone all the way through and thrown everything out, then I usually go back one filter at a time and see what else could be there. Um, we've also gone all the way through and ended up with a list of five genes, and we have no idea. We don't think any of them are relevant. <laughs> um, and so then we have to do, you know, a little bit more digging to try and say, okay, um, you know, what does this particular gene do? Can we test it somehow? Is there a mouse model available? We've called up people that had mouse models and say, hey, can you send us ovaries? You know, do these mice have any phenotype? you know, related to fertility, um, and we've gotten them, and we find that there's no issues, you know, and so then you can rule that out, but it does take a little bit of, you know, a little bit more than just your typical search online. You have to do a little bit of experimental work to try and figure that out. So it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, I would say we've done about 10 or 15 families, and we've definitively identified a cause in maybe five at this point. So... It's definitely not a cut and dry solution. Other questions? Go ahead. Um, this might be a stupid question, but uh, there's no stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, is, that, is it that you start from the beginning? You start from like the BCF files and the variance coding files for individual sample, and then uh, do you lump all samples? If you have ten people, mm -hmm. sample of two people or ten people, do you lump everything together? Do the pipeline, or you need to do the same for individual person? Like, so it depends what you're looking for, right? So, in our particular case, if we're looking for something that's auto is inherited in a recessive manner, then we would take all of the information, apply our inheritance filter and get all of the variants that come out that are present in those daughters. But if you're looking at, say, um, there's a sibling in the family that has a unique phenotype, then maybe you want to look at just all of the variants in that individual and then compare those results to the other family members to say what's different. You know, so I, I can't definitively say, yes, we always look at every individual because it really depends on the type of analysis that you want to do. Does that, does that help? Okay, I would say that the inheritance, if you have a family and multiple family members, especially unaffected siblings of the same sex, is probably the most powerful tool you'll ever have in going through your variants. <coughs> hey, it's a great talk. Thanks. I have one question. For these family studies, how many variants normally, just to get an idea, how many you start? I mean, before filtering. Before filtering? What, 30,000 variants yes. per person? Per person. <laughs> so after uh, filtering and all those things, uh, how, I mean, before putting those, you know, database searches mm -hmm. and all those things, how many, uh, you know, many from 30,000 to? Um, some of the families more recently, now that our pipeline is more mature, we end up with two or three. Other families, we end up with 15. So it really, it depends on, um, we've had the fortune of having some consanguineous families. So that helps us get rid of a lot of variants. If you have like an American outbred family, you're probably going to end up with more variants to go through. Yeah. 
And the other question I have is, uh, I think I will get uh, get access to the PowerPoint. I want to know those two papers. Uh, the two papers? Yeah. Yeah, that's why I threw them in the PowerPoint, <laughs> just so we had this. Okay, go ahead. This might be more specific because uh, you put it in the wildcard category in the original mm -hmm. slides. The, do you often observe, because the reads probably span the exome supply site yeah. junctions, do you sometimes get variance in those? Yes, yes, we have identified supply site. Um, we, we always look for the exon plus or minus 10 base pairs on either side. Um, and we have identified one of the papers coming out is actually a splice variant that we identified. Yes, so my body is always, I'm never sure if that's actually a good variant or not because I don't know, maybe the aligner did something to the mapping part, you know, with the splice tensions and things well, like that. Well, you don't, I mean, yeah. it's, we've been fortunate to get cells from some of these patients and so we were actually able to look at the okay. splice uh, isoforms that were available. Yeah in the cell lines, and so we were able to confirm it that way. Um, any variant before we pursue other experimentation, we always validate with Sanger sequencing. Some people might say that that's not necessary um, at this point, but we, just as a double check, we always make sure, and I think in the last year, almost everything we've done has been validated by Sanger sequencing. Other questions? Thank you. I have a couple of announcements here. One is she mentioned that UCSC genome relevant. Uh, December 4 and 5, we have two whole day workshops here in the uh, fourth floor of Skiffa. And UCSC folks will come here and they will offer the workshop. The other thing is, uh, how many of you, uh, can you make any comment on, have you ever tried uh, genome tracks? You, you mentioned that you, uh, and what is your, uh, because we have the license. And right. it's not at all used. At all used means not heavily used at all. I was going to say, why don't, maybe you yeah, can comment I, I on that a little bit more. I use the lot. So. You use a lot, and it is, to me, when I try, I thought, why people are not using it? It's ridiculously simple. Yeah. You can put the The, the, the genome tracks can give you almost all the database machine all show here. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So you can get the DB snips, you can get the FGMB, you can get the, uh, the GWORS, all the, together. Yeah, all, all the together. together. So and, uh, another good thing for the genome tracks is uh, it also accepts the fat fail. You, you don't need, yeah, 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 you don't need to look the uh, variants one by one. Actually, you, you can just uh, paste hundreds, even thousands of variants, and uh, then you can get a uh, big tables. So you can pass that big table. Right. So that can I automatically have, done. I'm so so glad you to find it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because we have one thing. We have two consecutive access, uh, access for genome tracks. And everyone came to this talk. I will strongly suggest you to at least take that one. Because it makes, yeah, uh, people, that's the, that's the thing we are trying to uh, overcome. People don't know. Right. So what she mentioned in the last slide, you know, please spend some time in our toolkit. Every query created for every tool, if you click, you get a detailed description of what tools are. And for genome track, this is exactly what you did for this talk. Uh, you can upload a uh, DCF file, you can upload variety of formats, the bait file and all those, you can do it. And it's like a one-stop gateway, you can search all those information. They have some filtering options, like common variant and all those things, you can get rid of it. Uh, and, and that's great, so please use that. The other one I also want to mention, and because this is brand new, is Broad Institute recently released. It's called EXAC. So if you go to Broad, uh, it's like uh, uh, it, it's an entire exome sequencing. Uh, so many people who are using exome sequencing, they deposit the data. So you can find for your genome you know, what other people have found uh, in terms of variation. Those information is not present in DBC and all those things. And it's just started. So um, things will come uh, from the yeah. And the other one is, Today I am teaching at one o'clock uh, uh, is uh, the genetic variation server and stuff. And probably you, know, you came here, so probably you not come uh, at that time. It's called e or EMBL, European Biomedical Institute. They have a variant effect predictor. Yeah. That's uh, very good. Very good, you know, uh, their server speed increase. You can put batch and stuff. Uh, it, I would say kind of, uh, you know, free version of genome tracks because genome tracks has access to many proprietary uh, data but that one is also And your pipeline, is it freely available or uh, that, that means you guys published a paper on that or is? Uh, we have, uh, well, 
Well, the papers that will be out coming, they'll be available online December 1st. We'll have our pipeline filters and everything listed in them. And is it executive file? I mean, uh, the pipeline, you know, people can download it, or it will be available in the in a server, or? Um, that's up to, Wyong is our bioinformatician, so okay. he does all of the yeah, scripting so and everything. So our pipeline, you, you need to have the uh, computer science pipeline. So we, so we run all these things in the Linux system. Okay. So so yeah. That was my question next. The whole part when you went from the variance and filtering through literature function, a biologist had to be. Yeah. Because it's happened a couple of times where you send stuff and then you don't get the feedback. The biologist has to spend quite a bit of time. Yeah, we're definitely a two-person team. Yeah. He <laughs> comes up with a list of variants and then I do all the manual filtering after the fact. Um, but, I mean, I guess we should consider publishing our pipeline. I mean, he uses BWA, GATK, ANOR, which a lot broad institute basically um, put out there. We've just optimized it for our purposes, so. That's great. And I know the um, SAM core has the. SAM core has, has the as well as the GATK. Right. He's also yeah, extra to look But if you're not computer savvy friendly, I mean, it should be said that there are tools out there that you can do that, like CLC Workbench, Next gene we've worked with, they're a little bit more biologist friendly. You don't necessarily need to know a scripting language in order to use them. So if that's some, if that's a hurdle you have to get over, there are other tools about, available, which is why I didn't go into a lot of like, what are the specific parameters we take. <coughs> Wonderful, so. and normally I teach this databases, but I don't use it. Mm -hmm. So we, I got a really good perspective and you presented very nicely in the Thank user you. Uh, side of uh, this stuff. HGMD, that's the thing, another one I want to mention, human gene um, mutation database. Yeah, exactly. It has a yeah. free version, yeah. it has a paid version. Yes. And there's a huge difference between free and paid version. Mm -hmm. We have license for the paid version. And if we use genome tracks, then they use the paid version. So if we use genome tracks, then there should not be any problem. And uh, so please be aware of that. And everything you have to register to get that. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Great. All right, great. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for coming.